Okay, hello everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight we're continuing in our study of the book of Proverbs. We're going to begin in chapter 24. Uh, we tried to do this earlier but lost the internet connection, so we're starting it over again now. Uh, hopefully Brother Stephen will be able to join us uh, again soon. Uh, uh, Brother Eric's back with me. Say hi to everybody. Hello, everybody. It's me again, the hall mo. Okay, back to you. All right, please subscribe to Brother Eric's YouTube channel. Um, we're starting Proverbs chapter 24, verse 1. We'll look at it first in the KJV and then in the Amplified. He says, Be not thou envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them, for their heart studieth destruction, and their lips talk of mischief. All right. Well, it sounds pretty straightforward there in verse one. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, verse two talks about their heart studieth destruction. That sounds terrible. Wow. Okay. Well, you're right. This is very straightforward. It doesn't require a lot of, uh, you know, thought. Uh, uh, and this is something we've heard many times throughout the book of Proverbs already. It says, be not envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them. So, first of all, uh, sometimes people gain a lot of things through evil activities. Uh, and we see that uh, some people will get rich by being dishonest, and we get people can get envious or jealous of, of their success, even though they were successful through uh, dishonesty and evil means. Uh, and, but it says, not only do not envy them, but don't desire to be with them. So it, it, it's continuing to teach us to be careful who you associate with. Don't hang out with the wrong people because that will lead you into, uh, into destruction. For their heart study of destruction and lips talk of mischief. Let me read that in the Amplified. Do not there we go. Oh, okay, brother. Brother Stevens back with us. Okay, uh, tell me what you think of this uh, Proverbs uh, chapter uh, twenty-four, verse one and two. I'll read it in the Amplified for you. Do not be envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them, for their minds plot violence and their lips talk of trouble for the innocent. Well, my comment, you know, on that was, you know, I just said it a couple minutes ago was, like. When it says not to like desire to be with them, it's because of the same thing that we talked about like in the previous chapter. Because being around people like that can just really influence you in a bad way. Because like a lot of them, like you know, their hearts are just not in the place where they should be. And as it says, like their hearts study at destruction and their lips talk of mischief. So I mean, all it's going to do is just influence you to kind of start acting like them and kind of draw you, you know, into that crowd. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, sometimes we get some verses in Proverbs that are pretty straightforward and obvious, and uh, other times it seems like it's a riddle we got to unravel to figure out the meaning of it. But let me move on to the next verses now. Uh, verses, verse three says, "Through wisdom is a household builded, and by understanding it is established." And by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Okay, I think we agreed. Brother Eric's going to go first. I think we agreed. Uh, pretty straightforward there again. Uh, but then, on, uh, yeah, okay, go ahead. Uh, all right. Let me turn that light off. But okay, well, looking at. How it says here that, you know, through wisdom, you know, is a house built and by understanding is it established? Well, I mean, when I think about, you know, wisdom here, I think about, of course, you know, like wisdom in the Lord. But the thing is, you know, by understanding, you know, adding knowledge and, you know, as your faith grows, I mean, it's like a house building, you know, as Jesus said on the, on the rock. You know, the stronger you are, you know, in him. It's like you have that strong foundation, and you know it's nothing that can bring you down. As it says, you know, and by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all the precious and pleasant riches. So it's like, 
as your knowledge like grows in Jesus, I feel like you know the more treasures you know you build up you know in heaven, and you know the stronger you get you know in your faith you know and in your walk. You know, that's what I have to say about these two verses as of right now. Well, I noticed that you um, uh, took a spiritual interpretation of that and applied that to Jesus, even though he's not mentioned in the verse. So that's that's one of the things that we we can do, and as we go through the whole Bible, we can look at it from a historical, literal interpretation. Uh, we can look at it from a spiritual interpretation, and then we can also look at it from a personal interpretation based upon uh, our own life's experiences, what it means to us. So there's a lot of different ways that we can um, uh, interpret that these verses, but we. Yeah, but we don't want to apply our personal in, in interpretations on, uh, uh, in, uh, let's say, impose that on other people. That's just a personal thing that we need. We can gain from something or some insight, and it might be worth sharing it too. But uh, we can't say, "Thus saith the Lord," because uh, I see it this way because these experiences in my life, this is what it means to me. <laughs> so, the literal historical uh, interpretation is what we need to. To uh, really use for our doctrines, uh, but I'm, I want to know if you're if you can draw a distinction between these three words: wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Are you addressing Stephen or anyone in particular? Or well, there's only two of you, and you did agree to go first. Remember? Okay. Uh, can you repeat that question? I'm sorry. All right. The question is. Can you, is there a difference between, and def define them if you can, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, those three? Oh, okay. Uh, well, uh, I'm going to pass on this one. <laughs> oh, okay, well, here I go. Let's hope I don't screw this up. Um, when I think of, you know, knowledge, I think about kind of like the information, you know, that you know, and just that, like, what you've built up, like, you know, like, the information and the learning that you have over time. And then, like, understanding, I feel like, kind of gets based off of knowledge and experience. It, so it could be, like, your way of, like, hmm. Actually, you know what? I'm a little bit tongue-tied, so I'm just going to stop here. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, why don't you do this, uh, um, one of you, or Eric, you do this. Uh, Google those three words and then read the definitions to us. Uh, but while you're looking that up, let me attempt to give you my take on this. I see uh, knowledge as the, the most basic of the three. That's where you're basically just acquiring facts, acquiring information. And then understanding is, is the next notch above knowledge. That's where you're taking the knowledge and you're really comprehending it. Uh, and then the, uh, then the top of the list, of course, is wisdom. That's where you take knowledge and understanding and you're applying it in your life so that it has some value to you. Uh, so that's how I would say, but um, Brother Eric, did, were you able to find those definitions? Uh, yes, Brother Luke. Now, the definition for wisdom is the quality of having experience, knowledge, and good judgment, the quality of being wise. Okay, it looks like they threw knowledge in there. But uh, now, uh, let's check knowledge. Knowledge means facts, information, and skills acquired by a person through experience or education the theoretical or practical understanding of a subject. And lastly, understanding means the ability to understand something, comprehension. Okay, there's all three definitions. All right. And so uh, IMA Joe, uh, it's getting kind of deep. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, the, my take on it, I still think, uh, based on those definitions, it still applies here. And if we take it, let's let's take it, considering this, we we 
we read this and we study it and we gain knowledge. Uh, we we can quote scriptures. We uh, we we can tell you what the Bible says. We have knowledge of what the Bible says. Now, just because we can quote a verse and we have knowledge of the verse doesn't mean we necessarily understand all the depths of things that verses uh, that verse has for us to to, to learn. So. You can first acquire knowledge, and then you want to have a deep understanding of that knowledge. And then finally, is if you apply these, this knowledge and understanding of the scriptures, if you apply it to your life, that's wisdom is knowledge and understanding applied. That's uh, that's my take on it, but uh, we'll move on unless you want to say respond to that. Well, I concur, and I think all my lawyers would concur. No additional comments as of now. Okay, let me move on to the next verse then. Uh, verse uh, 5, a wise man, oh, I didn't read those last two verses in the KJ, in, in the Amplified. Let me see how, how it phrases it. It says, through skillful and godly wisdom, uh, a house, a life, a home, a family is built. By understanding, it is established on a sound and good foundation. And by knowledge, its rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. I would say that the first, the first verse there, uh, verse 3, says, through skillful and godly wisdom. So skillful, uh, it, to me, that is illustrating the point, the distinction I was making. You're, if you're skillful, uh, wisdom requires skill uh, because you're actually applying the knowledge and understanding with skill. Um, all right, let me go on to the next uh, verse in the KJV. It says, A wise man is strong, yea, a man, a man of knowledge increaseth strength. For by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war, and in multitudes of counselors there is safety. Well, as you can imagine, uh, I love these two verses, and uh, I'm sure the reason why will be uh, very apparent here in the near future. Okay, back to you. Okay, well, looking at, you know, verse 5, you know, I think that's pretty, I think it speaks for itself. You know, they're saying, you know, a wise man is going to be strong. You know, and that, you know, a man you know, of, you know, a lot of knowledge. Of course, I would think about it, you know, as knowledge of Christ, because I'm thinking about it the spiritual way. But still, you know, a man of knowledge, you know, who just keeps, you know, increasing is definitely just going to keep getting stronger and stronger, you know, as a wise man is strong. And then it says, of course, that you'll have, you know, a wise counsel. And, and in a multitude of counselors, you know, there is a safety. So I think that kind of makes me think about, you know, fellowship. And you know, just like studying together. That's just my take on it. Like, what do you say? Well, there's a lot of uh, verses uh, talking about uh, it's it's wise to receive counsel, and in this one and some others talks about a multitude of counselors. Uh, in other words, a wise man has many counselors, and this is something that uh, uh, if if you didn't understand what. Brother Eric has said over the last couple of months, when he keeps on saying he needs to talk to his lawyers, uh, that this is this verse is uh, making that case that we need to have some wise people that we can go to, to to help us understand things, to get counsel, not only on understanding the scriptures, but on just life as a whole. You know. Uh, uh, how to live our life if there's any problems. You need to have people you can talk to that you believe are wise who can give you counseling. Because if a fool tries to figure out everything on his own, um, someone told me once that they said, isn't, isn't um, experience the best teacher instead of listening to other people? I said, well, the, the, the best uh, uh, experience is a hard teacher. That's learning the hard way through your own experience by making, through trial and error, making your own mistakes. If you're wise, you go get counseling from people who have already been through that, and you can learn from their mistakes. So 
if you want to learn from experience, why don't you learn from other people's experiences? That would be wisdom. And, and this is something that's very important, and it's probably one of the main tenets of uh, Eric-ism. Right, brother? Absolutely, brother Luke. And I remember the guy that last said that experience is the best teacher, and I promptly enrolled him into the school of hard knocks. Okay, back to you. All right, let, Brother Stephen, are you ready to say something? Oh, no, I was just going to say that I just didn't have any additional comments. Okay. All right, let me read this now in the uh, Amplified. Um, it says, A wise man is strong, and a man of knowledge strengthens his power. For by wise guidance you can wage your war, and in an abundance of wise counselors there is victory and safety. So, um, uh, I, I think that, uh, I wish I learned this when I was a really young man. And uh, Brother Stephen, you're a young man. If, if I could go back in time and, and to, to your age, uh, I would apply this as, as one of the most important foundations for the rest of my life, is uh, seek out people who uh, can advise you about life. For example, you're studying uh, uh, construction uh, contracting. Con you're studying to be a, a, a building contractor, I guess. So you need to find some people who are really successful in that. Seek them out. Ask them if they would take you under their wing and mentor you and use their their experience and their counseling. And you will you will your path to success will be like this instead of like that. I guess you don't have any say about that, so I'll move on. I think, uh, brother Luke, I think he should have concurred by now. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Sorry, I just kind of zoned out right there, but um, yeah, let's let's move on. All right. Um, verse seven: Wisdom is too high for a fool; he openeth not his mouth in the gate. He that deviseth to do evil shall be called a mischief per, mischievous person. Let's just look at verse seven. Wisdom is too high for a fool. He that now he openeth his he openeth not his mouth in the gate. Well, okay. Let me see if you can explain that one to me. Well, that's pretty obvious to me, brother Luke. Uh, in the old time, the gate was where they held their legal proceedings, and. Uh, well, a fool, he's not going to be able to keep up with uh, uh, all the uh, wise men at the gate that are doing their thing. Okay. Well, I have to agree with, you know, what he said about the second part of that verse. You know, I think verse, you know, 8 obviously speaks for itself. But, you know, when I see wisdom is too, you know, high for a fool, I guess that kind of makes me think about, like, how... A fool is not going to want to, like, obtain knowledge, you know, and obtain understanding, and then, of course, obtain wisdom. A fool just kind of wants to do it kind of in, like, a reckless way or kind of, like, in his own way and not try to do it, you know, the right way, the wise way, or, you know, as, like, we say, you know, like, the Christian way. Yeah, that's all I have about this verse until we discuss it further. Okay, I'm going to read that in the Amplified, but Brother Eric, could you look up the word fool for me? Give me the definition of that, okay? I'm going to read this in the Amplified. Um, word verse 7. Wisdom is too exalted for a hardened, arrogant fool. He does not open his mouth in the gate where the city's rulers sit in judgment. So it seems to me that... Uh, this um, amplified the way it is amplified this verse expounded it it's uh, expanded it it's uh, it's in agreement with uh, brother Eric's premise I'll read that again he does not open his mouth in the gate where the city's rulers sit in judgment 
And then verse 8, he who plans to do evil will be called a schemer or divisor of evil. Um, Brother Eric, did you find a definition for the word fool? Yes, a fool, a person who lacks good sense or judgment, a stupid or silly person, a person who enjoys something too very much, a dessert made with cooked fruit and cream. Okay, I think that's far enough. <laughs> yeah, fool seems like a pretty harsh word. Uh, to uh, Jesus said, "Do not call any man fool," and then Paul calls them foolish. Galatians. Uh, I wonder if you can explain that to me. I thought we already addressed this issue, Brother Luke, and you were so happy to finally come to the conclusion that Jesus did not actually tell us not to call people a fool, but he said that we would be in judgment, uh, in danger of judgment, for calling people of a fool. And, and that's okay if you do it properly. There's a, a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. Okay, back to you. Yeah, Jesus did talk about being in danger of judgment, but I feel like he was just really talking about, like, pretty much just don't make, like, ridiculous assumptions. Pretty much just don't just start, you know, chastising people, you know, for no reason and just cutting someone down. Because, like, and he, because a lot of the time he talked about, you know, people were just hypocrites. And, you know, people themselves were, you know, full of sin anyway. So and there's no point in just, you know, tearing down someone else when you yourself, you know, as he said, you know, you yourself have a plank in your eye, and you're just trying to, like, blast someone just for a small thing. So, I mean, yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. I'm uh, going on to the KJV verse uh, 9. Uh, the thought of foolishness is sin, and the scorner is an abomination to men. Now this is one of those uh, verses that really cuts to the heart of the law because it says even the thought of foolishness is sin. And Jesus talked about that too. Okay. Yes, Jesus did put a lot of importance, you know, on, you know, sinful thoughts. Because, you know, it's not just actions. You know, actions are just the fruits of, you know, like, you know, the actual, you know, source, which is the heart, and, you know, and your actual thoughts. And, you know, it says the thought of foolishness, you know, just not wanting to understand, just wanting to do stupid things, or just wanting to, you know, just deviate, you know, from, you know, what the Lord gives you, you know, and what he says should be, well, you know, it is a sin. Now, of course, you know, those who have, you know, accepted Jesus, you know, are saved and are not in danger of it, but it's just saying that, it's just not good for you to do that. Okay, I'll read it in the Amplified, see the difference. It says, he who plans to do evil will be, will be called a schemer or divisor of evil. Well, that was verse 8. Um, verse 9 is, the devising of folly is sin, and the scoffer is repulsive to men. So it translates the word scoffer, rather than uh, uh, the sc scorner. So scorner and scoffer. Uh, we should not be scorners, scornful, or whatever is scoffful, if that's a word. Um, all right, let me go on to verse 10 in the Amplify, in the KJV. If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Brother Luke, I really love this verse because every time I uh, have a nervous breakdown, <laughs> I remember this verse. <laughs> All right, well, I think it speaks for itself. As it says, if you, you know, faint in the day of adversity, like if you just, you know, collapse and just, you know, keel over it like the slightest, you know, challenge or like the slightest, you know, trial or storm or whatever in life, you know, your strength, at least your strength on your own, is not that good because if you can't, you know, handle, you know, something like that, you know, how are you going to handle, you know, something bigger like that? So, I mean, obviously we need, you know, Christ's strength because, you know, through him we can do all things. But as it says here, though, 
like if you're just gonna like collapse and just you know over one you know adverse thing, then it's not really gonna help you get through you know other you know big things. Yeah, it, it's 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 kind of an artful way of of just saying that hey, um, you need to get strong instead because you're going to deal with adversity in your life. I don't think now see a lot of people today. Um, there's, I've heard a lot of arguments about the generations. Uh, it's it's common to to uh, to label the my father's generation as the greatest generation. It's very common for you know, people for me to hear uh, people discuss them in that way. They went through World War II. They went through the Depression. They survived all that. That's the greatest def greatest generation. They say. And then, uh, and I've always thought that I admired that generation much more than my own, which is my generation is the, 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 the revol we, we went through our own revolution, but I don't think it was very good. It was sex, drugs, rock and roll, rebellion, rebelling against uh, the system. And uh, many of us have grown up to, to look back and say, wow, I, we made a lot of mistakes. Uh, it was crazy. But, uh, uh, and then, my sister says no. She thinks we're the greatest generation because we're we were so liberal. We accepted things like we tried to get rid of racism and various types of prejudice and and sexism. And so she that's what she thinks is great. Uh, but what I'm seeing now is that this future gen this generations like yours, brother brother Stephen, I'm seeing on the news all the time now stories about. Uh, Yale University and other places where they're actually protesting and, and causing the the chancellors and the presidents of the universities to be fired or resign because they, the, the students have grievances that they that they're uh, they don't even want free speech because they they want to be protected from anything that is too harsh in the language like if you if you challenge someone's ideas or if you have a different uh, political viewpoint than theirs and they say they want safe rooms where they can go and be safe from anything that's that could be hurtful to them in terms of their uh, having to listen to anything they don't want to hear about my point is it seems like this generation I'm, I'm watching come up behind me it's, it's, it seems to me very, very weak. Uh, and this that's what this verse makes me think of, is if thou faint in the day of adversity, come on, uh, whatever that generation is. What generation is yours, Brother Stephen? What, are you not, uh, are you not X or, uh, or uh, what's? I believe I'm generation Y. I, I think I'm Y. So there's X, there's Y, and there's something else. Uh, I don't know if it's Z or not, but no, uh, no, there's there's another name for it. Double X or something like that. No, it's not. It's not a letter. It's a. Uh, uh, well, my point is, it seems that your generation here is, is really, from the way I perceive it, is very, very weak and fragile. Oh and yeah. I think that I think that the, in the, this verse is here is saying, look. You've got to face reality. In life, you're going to have to deal with a lot of adversities. And that's why one thing that really bothers me, so one of the changes I've seen in America, is the concept of hate speech and hate crimes. Um, I think that that's really um, un uncalled for. We shouldn't have laws against hateful speech. We shouldn't have laws saying that a particular crime is 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 elevated as being even worse because it's, it was motivated by some kind of hate, uh, racial hatred, religious hatred, or whatever it is. Um, I, I believe in freedom, and that's what I value most about America, is freedom. And I, I think that a person should be free to say hateful things. Now, I don't want to say hateful things. Uh, but I want people to be free to say it. If someone wants to say some, say you're just some uh, religious crackpot, you're some, a religious bigot or whatever. If they want to call me some kind of a name, I don't want to say, oh no, no, it's hate speech. 
put them in jail or something. I want everybody to free to, to say hateful things. Other, if we if we start censoring what people say, we, we lose our freedom of speech. And uh, but I think that this generation that I, I'm observing now, your generation, whatever it is, it seems to be so fragile. They ought to study this verse because they're going to have to learn. There's adversity in life, you know. I don't want someone, there should be laws against hurting people physically, hurting people financially, or hurting them, slandering them, libel. These are law, laws that are justified. But making a law saying, I, you can't hurt someone's feelings, that's absurd. Yeah, because like, well, a lot of people, that, I mean, I'm a college student at UF, so, you know, I've been around a very diverse, Verse group of people, and this verse definitely applies because you know, I'll, you know, no one's gonna have the same opinion like on everything. And I know, like, have a bunch of you know friends who it's like you know I decide to speak my mind, you know, to them, or somebody else will try to speak their mind, and, and you know, it and conflicts what they say, and they just want to you know cover up their ears and go suck their thumb in the corner of the room. It's like they just don't. Even, it's like they want to shut out anything that's not theirs, or if they don't like it, they'll just keel over. It's like. It's literally, you know, insane, you know, what I've seen. And as it said, like, your strength is, you know, it's not going to be big if you can't, you know, face, you know, just a small adverse, like, thing like a conversation, you know, like in this case. Or just like, you know, a simple argument that can be, you know, easily resolved or something that doesn't need to be, like, how it is. So if you're just going to keel over or just try to, you know, stick your head in the sand and, you know, something like that, you know, your strength is there's not that much of it. There's some more I want to say on this, but I'd like to get Brother Eric's input on it first. Well, we've had such great uh, input on it thus far. Very interesting topic that you guys have expounded on. And, yeah. Yeah. I like it. Okay. All right. Um... I forgot to mute while you were talking. Sorry, uh, but um, you know I don't want to. I, I see your unit, your uh, generation as being very weak and fragile, but I also can see in my dealings with uh, Christians on YouTube, uh, I can see I don't know what generation everybody's in. I don't. I I, I haven't met everybody through uh, these hangouts or on Skype, and I don't necessarily. A lot of times. Uh, people just send text comments. I don't know what generation they're in, but I will say that overall in Christianity, I see this also, where they're very weak. And to if they hear something that is not what they're used to hearing, they faint and they they can't deal with it. They can't. I've I've seen people actually get a knee jerk reaction where you you say something like, let's say they're a KJV onlyist, for example. And and uh, you you quote something from a different translation, and oh man, they just like freak out. They're so fragile, they can't cope with it. Now, uh, that's why I think it's it's very beneficial to um, listen to all the other viewpoints on theology. I mean, I have I have many positions that I that I hold, and I, I'm very confident that I'm, I'm right and then there's many more positions where uh, I've studied it I'm not so sure which is right but at least what I'm willing to do is I'm willing to listen to the other side and hopefully I'll learn and maybe I'll be convinced or not but we should be strong enough to be able to hear something that is different than instead of shrinking under oh no I can't take it because this is it, it oh no you think there's a a post-tribulation rapture. Oh, don't hurt my ears like that. Um, I've uh, I've spent a lot of time the last couple of weeks uh, watching. Oh, let me see. There's probably about 30 hours altogether I've watched here. 30 hours, and this is a college course from a seminary, and it's a Roman Catholic seminary. So people take this class. And they're getting seminary training, but it's from a Roman Catholic, uh, you know, institution. And I've learned an awful lot of interesting things. But when I very the very first video I watched, I shrug. I, oh, I can't believe that. For example, the first thing that really bothered me, he says he's referring to 
the God is he, and he said, oh, well, or, you, or he or she, whatever, however you want to see it. I'm thinking, uh, I don't know if I'm going to like this, but I was willing to go on and listen. I'm glad I did, because about 30 hours of, of learning about uh, church history from their perspective, it, uh, I've gained a lot of understanding, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad I spent the time doing it. But I didn't shrink back and say, oh, no, he referred to God as he or she. And I, I said, oh, I can't listen anymore. Be gone. Amen, Brother Luke. I like how Kent Tovin phrased it. He said, eat the chicken, eat the meat, and spit out the bones. And Jesus said, those that believe in him can drink poison, and it won't uh, harm them. And uh, he was talking about uh, poison being false doctrine, I believe. What do you think? Well, I guess you can put it as that way, but I guess I don't have too much as of right now to say. Yeah. I'm not going to take a position on the, the eating the poison and the handling the snakes, uh, but um, let me move on here. Um, let me see. Verse 11. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death and those that are ready to be slain, uh, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth not he know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? Boy, I love this verse. And I will only reconcile this verse to one thing. And that's the preaching of the good news of Jesus Christ that the whole world must hear. Okay. I actually don't have too much to say as of right now. Let's see, what do you have to say about it? I'm going to have to read it in the Amplified before I say anything here. Uh, it's starting with verse 12, I guess. Uh, no, verse 11. Verse 11. Rescue those who are being taken away to death and those who stagger to the slaughter. Oh, hold them back from their doom. Now, that could be referring to the judgment, the second death. I could see that. Uh, if you claim ignorance and say, see, we did not know this, does he not consider it who weighs and examines the hearts and their motives? Uh, so, uh, in other words, uh, people are without excuse. Uh, you know, it's it's to me, it's like the uh, saying, "Well, you you know, how am I supposed to believe in God? You never showed yourself to me." And and God says, "Well, no, all of creation uh, testifies of me." And and then it says, "And does He not know it? It who guards your life and keeps your soul, and and will He not repay you and every man according to his works?" Uh, repaying you according to your works, of course, that is uh, the, a principle. Uh, we know that we're going to get paid according to our works. Uh, our bad works uh, are forgiven. Our good works uh, in Christ uh, will be rewarded uh, with gold, silver, and precious gems, the treasures in heaven. The lost, though, they're going to be uh, they're going to be judged uh, according to their works, and they're going to be found that, uh, look, look at all the bad works that you did. You you don't even de deserve to, to live. You deserve to be condemned and die, but Jesus died for your sins. And and we told you that, but you rejected it. You wouldn't even receive it. He died for you. How ironic is that? How sad is that? He died for your sins. You wouldn't accept him as your Savior. So look at the we find you guilty. When I say we, that's the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen to that. Yeah, amen. All right, let's move on here a little further. Um, Uh, what 
verse am I on here? Gee, I got confused here. I think you're on verse 13 now. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. My son, eat thou honey, because it is good, and the honeycomb, which is sweet to thy taste. So shall the knowledge of wisdom be unto thy soul. When thou hast found it, then there shall be a reward, and thy expectation shall not be cut off. I love this verse because uh, every time the Bible says something's good, uh, I believe it. So I believe honey is good for you. Jesus said salt is good. I believe salt is good for you. Uh, the Old Testament says, uh, butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. So I believe butter is good, milk, it's all good. <laughs> okay. Well, when, let's say we're talking about honey here, of course, as it says, like this, you know, as wisdom to your soul. Like, it says definitely, well, it says eat. So it definitely means just, you know, take in, you know, take on wisdom because it's good for your soul. And, you know, and, of course, when you find wisdom, you know, when you just gain more, you know, there's, of course, it's going to reward you, of course, in the future, you know, through, you know, several ways because, you know, A, you'll know how to get through things better. You know, you'll be stronger. And as it says, you know, your expectation, you know, won't be cut off. So it's like, you know, the more wisdom you get, you know, the better it is for you, you know, as time goes on. Yeah, it's uh, it, it ju just as honey is sweet, uh, wisdom and knowledge is also sweet. It, it it will benefit you, and you'll you'll be rewarded if you if you seek out wisdom, knowledge, understanding. You're going to be rewarded. Uh, your reward won't be cut off from you. You won't you won't be denied. Um, let me move on here. Uh, let me see. It was 14, so I'm on verse 15. Lay not wait, O wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Spoil not his resting place. For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. Okay, I've never paid much attention to verse 15. Uh, probably because it wasn't addressed to me, but now I love verse 16, and uh, that's just the hallmark of a true child of God, and the Lone Ranger, who never says die. Okay, back to you. Well, as it says, you know, for a just man, you know, follow seven time. Well, of course, I'm just going to keep referring to it, I guess, as, you know, wisdom, you know, as it's pro this because this is the context of what we're talking about in Proverbs. But as it says, you know, as a you know wise man falls, you know, a wise man is going to keep getting back up because you know obviously he has experience, you know, he has knowledge, you know, both here but and of course in the Lord. But of course, like you know, a foolish man is just going to you know just you know just crumple up and you know just easily fall apart, you know, in any you know you know adverse situation or you know anything like that. And of course, it's saying you know just you know. It says, lay not wait. It means it's just don't just sit there, you know, and, you know, do nothing, pretty much. Mm hmm Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, the, 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 this uh, wise man is going to get up, even though uh, we have adversity in our lives. We do not, you know, faint when fa facing adversity. We, we get knocked down and we'll get back up. If we have wisdom, we know that we'll continue to get back up, continue trying. Sometimes it takes many efforts before you're going to succeed. Um, now, it, it says seven times, but um, do you think that it literally means that uh, if you're wise, you will get up seven times? Does it literally mean you'll get up seven, not four, five, six times, not eight, nine, ten times, but seven times. Does it literally mean that? No, Brother Luke, it's actually talking about God raising him up himself and being his strength, which is in Christ Jesus. Okay. What I'm asking about the number seven. Well, well right. that's what the number is indicating that it's not the man himself. But the power of God in him. Oh, okay. So th th this is an example of 
of what I referred to earlier, talking about the different ways to interpret scripture, where you're spiritualizing this. And I'm not saying it's not valid. It's a, it could be a very valid point. Uh, uh, but uh, so when you see the number seven, you identify it with God. And that is a dumb number that uh, we think is God's number. Um, but uh, what I'm wondering is, um, is a specific number, are we to take it as you'll get up uh, exactly seven times, more or less, or is it literal in that sense? No, like, I don't think it's, you know, obviously not literal in that sense. You know, it's like a number saying seven, that means it's, in reality, just like Jesus said, when it like comes to forgiving sin, forgiving, you know, 70 times seven, it just means that, you know, no matter, you know, how many times, you know, you fall, like, you fall, you'll just continue to get up, you know, no matter what. Like, it doesn't matter, you know, how much, you'll be able to keep getting up. Not just once, not just twice, not just three times, not just four times, but you'll keep doing it, pretty much. Um, yeah, that, that's what I was thinking. Jesus' use of the terms, uh, when Peter asked him, shall I forgive my brother seven times? And he thought he was being quite generous and showing how, how forgiving he's capable of being. And Jesus said, so not seven, seven times 70, uh, which means, I think, the way I've always taken it, is that it's, uh, no, there's no limit to the number of times. You continue forgiving. Um, that's the point you're breaking, making there, uh, Brother Stephen, but I've learned something recently that was very interesting. Someone identified this Jesus' statement of 7 times 70 with Daniel's uh, 7 times 70. Are you familiar with Dan Daniel's uh, uh, 70 yeah. weeks of years? Yeah. So, in other words, Daniel made a prediction about 70 weeks of years. A, a week of years is seven years, and 70 of them would be 490 years. And that was a prophecy uh, about when the, the, uh, the rebuilding of the, the temple in Jerusalem would happen and the coming of the Messiah. And uh, uh, so, but it, is it interesting that Daniel says, uh, 70 weeks of years, or 70 times 7, and then Jesus took the same number in his example saying, no, don't forgive him 7 times, forgive him 70 times 7 times. Now how does that, is there a connection between those two? Has anybody uh, made a connection? And I'd just like to point out, I just read this book today, it brought me to tears. I highly recommend everybody read it. Mm -hmm. uh, who wrote it? Monty Christensen. And is he, is he taking a uh, dispensational futurist viewpoint or historicist viewpoint or what? It's just about his personal experience and it's very compelling. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So that book is, is about Jesus' statement of forgiving, not Daniel's state, his prophetic statement. Right, and I'd, I'd like to know how that does tie into Daniel's uh, statement. I, I don't think it does tie in. I just think that Jesus used the same number, but it's not because uh, forgiving 70 times 7 somehow relates back to uh, 490 years of Daniel. I don't think they're related in that way. Uh, okay, let me go on here. Uh, what verse am I on again? Oh, yeah, sometimes. Verse 17. Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth, lest the Lord see it, and it, displease, it displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. <laughs> And he turned away his wrath from him. Okay, now this is a, uh, there's a phrase for this, and it's a very odd thing, wouldn't you say? Um, okay, well, when I look at this, when it says, Rejoice not with you when thine enemy followeth, and let not thy heart be glad when he stumbleth. Well, I mean, it's as Jesus said, you know, you don't want to, you know, hate your enemy. And you don't want your, you know, anyone to just, you know, fall down. And you just, and you don't want to just watch people collapse or anything. I mean, we want to build people up, and we want people to get knowledge and strengthen the Lord. We don't want to, you know, sit here and watch people fall and watch, you know, just. 
It's like basically like if I were to know like some – any person, I wouldn't want them to just to watch – like who I know doesn't know Judas. I wouldn't want them to sit here and watch them die and then laugh at them as they burn in hell. You know, I would want them to, you know, to obviously come to Jesus, you know, and know him. So, I mean, just God talks about that. We shouldn't, you know, be hating people, you know, who disagree with us, you know, or against us. We should be, you know, trying to, you know, help them. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to mention, I think it's a paradox. Go ahead. I'm sorry. All right. Um, look up the word paradox. And I don't, if I understand that word, I don't think it's the right word for this situation. But look it up and see. But I want to relate it to something else here. I'm reading this in the Amplified now. Uh, it says, do not, verse 17 and 18, do not rejoice and gloat when your enemy falls. And do not let your heart be glad in self-righteousness when he stumbles. Or the Lord will see your gloating and be displeased and turn his anger away from your enemy. Um, I think that's very interesting that, uh, I mean, it, it, it seems really like uh, very, uh, very thoughtful, very generous, very uh, spiritual. Don't gloat when your enemy is, is having a difficult time. Uh, uh, and, but, then, but then at the very end it says, because God might be upset with you, and then st take his wrath away from your enemy, so so it, it'll it will be quenched. He, so I don't know. Uh, that kind of surprised me. The end of that verse, uh, but it, it makes me think of another verse that uh, I don't even know if it's going to be exactly related. But uh, when Paul Paul is talking about uh, when your enemy is persecuting you. He says, give them food, give them drink, be kind to them, show them love. And it's it's like putting burning hot coals on their head. Now, burning hot, putting burning hot coals on their head, and then, and, and uh, in other words, someone is being horrible to you, and instead of being horrible back to them, you show them love and kindness, and in, in effect, it's like putting burning hot coals on their head. Uh, what did what do you think that means? Putting burning hot coals on their head. Okay, it has to mean uh, that the judgment will be upon them, right? Well, I mean, maybe, but I guess he, when I think about it, it's like they're sitting here being, you know, however they want to be, you know, just however bad they want. And you, when you sit here and you know, I guess treat them well. In a, in a sense, they may just come to the realization is, oh, wait a second, what am I doing? They'll actually realize, like, the extent to, like, what they're doing, and it could, you know, burn them. And, you know, when I, like, in that sense. So, like, as, like, a coal would burn you, when they just realize it, it just completely will just, like, probably burn them, you know, on the inside, if you know what I mean. Uh, well, uh, I, I mean... Brother Eric, you you said could it be God's judgment on them? Maybe maybe that does apply in that case. But I've I've always thought that it it should be interpreted as they'll feel ashamed. In other words, what and I've, I this has played out many times for me in dealing with people. I, I've had people I'm preaching or I'm teaching and, and 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 they'll come up and try to insult me and stuff, and then I'll I'll respond in a way that they're not expecting with patience, soft, a soft answer turns away wrath, uh, and, and uh, show them love and consideration instead of reacting, instead of stooping to their level is, is what they expect and it's what they want because they want to fight. They want to me to be just like them and be exposed that you're not such a good Christian after all, are you? Look, you, you, you lose your temper. But when you don't lose your temper, when you're patient and kind, then what happens to them? Burning hot coals represents the shame and embarrassment they have because, and I've seen it happen numerous times where people say, Brother Luke, I'm, I want to apologize to you. I, I, the way I treated you and then the way you reacted to it, I'm so ashamed of the way I treated you because you didn't respond in kind. Now, have I done that my whole life every time perfectly? I regret to say no. But uh, but what I have responded to people in that way, uh, that's the kind of reaction you you get quite often. 
they are feel ashamed of how they treated you. Uh, so now, does that relate to this verse here uh, in Proverbs? I, I'm not sure, but let me just get your reaction to that before we consider that. Well, I love how uh, you and Stephen both uh, had the similar uh, tone, and uh, that's a beautiful way to express it. Uh, conviction. They become conviction by the Holy Spirit. Maybe the cults represent the Holy Spirit. Okay. Yeah, because like, like they want, like they might want you to stoop to their level, but it's like when you show them like that kindness, it's like they start to realize you know what they what, like what they're actually doing or saying, and they'll probably be ashamed of like how they're acting, you know, and it'll just you know cut them to like the core, you know, in a sense. All right. Um... I think that uh, we started a second time. We started basically about 7.15, and now it's 8.11, so there's enough time for us to do our, uh, uh, our gospel invitation. So let's, uh, let's reserve some time for that. We'll pick up next time uh, we get to Proverbs with chapter 24, verse 19. Okay, But uh, the book of Proverbs is a unique book in that uh, King Solomon said that he wrote these things down to teach his son wisdom because if he has wisdom he'll be more successful in life and um, and that's what we gain from the book of Proverbs. A proverb is a saying that has truth in it that will teach you a lesson. Sometimes a proverb is one verse, sometimes it's two, three, four, five verses strung together but the book of Proverbs is not like the book of John or the book of Genesis or any other books the other books are uh, historical accounts of real events and real people, uh, but Proverbs is not like that. So uh, in Proverbs, we're seeking wisdom, but if, if we did not tell you uh, the most important wisdom, then we would be negligent, and that, that is what Paul called in his letter to Timothy, wisdom unto salvation. So I'm going to leave this up to uh, Brother Stephen. Uh, I want you to tell the, the viewers, um, what is wisdom unto salvation? Well, and this is what I love about the gospel, you know, that it's a very, very, you know, simple message. And that is that, you know, Christ died, was buried, and rose again for your sins. So I'll start off by quoting John 3.16, which I believe is the you know, gospel in a nutshell. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, Jesus being, you know, fully, let's say while being, you know, God's only son, his perfect son, fully God, you know, part of the Godhead, came down here to earth, you know, in the form of a man, fully man, like in the flesh, just like we are, came down here, you know, was born, he lived the perfect life you know, that we couldn't live, he was sinless, he was perfect. You know, he performed many miracles. He fulfilled the law. He was pleasing to his father. But then he paid the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. Like he, can, as, you know, being God and not having to, put on flesh and tasted death for us. He was crucified in a very painful way. Crucified, you know, shed his blood for us, you know, was buried. And then three days later, he rose again. Now, when he rose again, he proved that he had the power to take life back and prove that he was the Son of God. But when he died on the cross, he put all the sins of the world on him. He took away, he paid the penalty that we, des let's say, that we deserved. And all we have to do to have salvation is to believe on him. As it says in John 6.47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Now, the important thing is, there is no other way besides Jesus. As Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man will come to the Father but by me. Now, a lot of people, or many false prophets might tell you about that it's about your works, that you need to stop sinning, and that you need to, like, produce your fruits, you know, and, like, basically it's like a gift that you have to earn it, you have to deserve it. 
or the, like you believe in something else. Well, when it comes to that, Romans 3.10 says, there is no one righteous, not even one. And as it says in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Well, of course, it goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All of us are sinners, and all of us deserve death. You know, of course, and this death is talking about hell. You know, the second death, which is so much more worse you know, than the first death, which is it's eternal, you know, it's torment and everything. And it's something that all of us deserve because all of us are unrighteous. But the good news is Jesus came and paid the full penalty, you know, when he died for us. And he makes it so simple. It's a gift. All we have to do is believe on him. As it says in Acts 6.31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So all we have to do, because he bought it with his blood when he died for us. All we have to do is put our faith and trust in him alone. Don't trust in yourself. Don't trust in anything else, not at your works, not Buddha, not any other religion or any other belief. Because Jesus, you know, he's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. You know, he's God's only, you know, perfect son. He took the penalty all on himself, and he's giving us the free gift. He's got it stretched out to us, and all we have to do is accept it and trust in him and him alone. So that's all. That's the invitation I have for everybody tonight who's listening. You know, if you don't know Jesus, I pray you come to him today. Today is the day of salvation. Just come to him and trust him and live. And that's all I have on this. Oh, okay. Thank you, brother. Um, uh, I'm going to post um, uh, on this video in the description box uh, my statement of faith that tells you the core doctrines of Christianity and uh, Bible verses that support the message you just heard from uh, Brother Stephen. So uh, I hope you'll go look at all that. Uh, but what we're all we're really asking you to do is uh, trust a person. See this this icon right here. Uh, this this is a picture of someone trusting Jesus, reaching out to Jesus for salvation. He wants to take you up to heaven, and uh, he's the only one that can do it. You can't get there on your own. So just trust him. Uh, he is our great Savior God. So put your faith in him. We're not asking you to do anything more than that. You don't have to join a religion. You don't have to become a religious person. You don't have to follow some set of religious rules. Salvation is simple and easy. Trust Jesus Christ for your salvation. And, and he guarantees he'll take you to heaven because you put your faith in him. All right, brothers, thank you for participating tonight. Uh, uh, join me nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.